Hi everyone. This is my seventh video. Today I'm going to read to you a short story by Gwyn Jones from his selected short stories. Gwyn Jones is known as a particularly influential Welsh author, um, but in fact most of his work is out of print, and even this copy that I have you can see is a discarded library book that was never checked out. So I don't know, maybe he's more famous in Wales. The story I'm going to read is called Their Bonds Are Loosed From Above, and it is pretty scary. If you don't like horror stories, I would suggest skipping this video. Um, it takes place during the Blitzkrieg of World War II. That explains the bombing that we're going to hear about. Their bonds are loosed from above. And Yael went out to meet Sisera, and said unto him, Turn in, my lord, turn in to me, fear not. And when he had turned in unto her, into the tent, she covered him with a mantle. And he said unto her, Give me, I pray thee, a little water to drink, for I'm thirsty. And she opened a bottle of milk, and gave him drink, and covered him. Then Yael, Haber's wife, took a nail of the tent, and took an hammer in her hand, and went softly unto him, and smote the nail into his temples, and fastened it into the ground, for he was fast asleep and weary. So he died. Blessed above women shall Yael the wife of Haber the Canite be. Blessed shall she be above women in the tent. You wouldn't think there was anything in the fourth and fifth chapters of Judges to give a woman named Manod a bad turn, and she living in a fine house next door to a Methodist chapel. But that's where you'd be wrong. It gave her a turn, all right. One Monday morning. The house was in Igloos Street, and its name was Brynhefred. You never saw a nicer house of its kind, with a colored glass panel in the front door, a piano, and a big oak dresser from Flincher, blue as the sky with willow pattern china, and on the window table in the parlor, a well-dusted Bible with gold clasps. You never saw a nicer widow, either. Respectable, threepence in the plate every Sunday, none of your fly ones dangling a line for anything in navy trousers. A widow who kept to herself, and could keep to herself, for what with the insurance on Minode, deceased, she had more than her leg to fill an old stocking with. He was a peculiar fellow, that Minode. You never quite knew where you were with him. He had his ways, and what a soaker! It couldn't last, everyone knew that. Afterwards. Here today and gone tomorrow, and a last big bottle of brandy gone with him. Well, here's our wreath. It wasn't as though we didn't warn him. No one in Igloo Street will ever forget Sunday the 24th. Three hundred planes over, the wireless said. They rough plowed the city and sewed it with glass. No night for sleeping. The very dead shuddered in the ground. Yet, like many another, Mrs. Minode came down that Monday morning with more, more curiosity and exhilaration than dread. Nothing had fallen too near, not a window was out at Brynhufred. Yet there was something different about the house. She felt it at once, something she couldn't say. She lit a fire in the kitchen and had her breakfast. It was towards nine o'clock, as she drew back the curtains in the parlor, that she noticed the Bible open on the table in the window. She would have shut it without thinking, and only later felt surprised had she not noticed a number of ugly brown smudges on the right-hand page. This vexed her, for the Bible was a great treasure, and the less meddling with it, the better. She bent forward to examine the smudges, and could not help reading a few words. Among them were nail and hammer. Mrs. Minode felt herself in the midst of a silence that stretched past earth to the tingling stars. Yet it was silence audible, vibrating on her ear like telephone wires on a mountain in a high wind. 
She had, too, a sensation that everything save the Bible was receding from her on all sides, as though titanic springs had contracted outside our mortal dimension. But the Bible, its leaves humped at her like two unbroken waves of the sea, displayed in glittering black letters the tale of Yael and Sisera, not word by word, but verses and chapters simultaneously. Then she grew aware of the pulsing of her blood and the jump of her heart. There was a smell from the smudges that sickened her. But Mrs. Minot was a brave and strong-nerved woman. For some minutes, maybe, she stood gripping the table. And then she took out her handkerchief and flicked at the smudges and their dusting of red earth and shut the Bible with a heavy slapping of leaves, pressed the gold studs home, walked back into the kitchen. Ten minutes later, she re-entered the parlor. The Bible was shut and flat, the window secure. Everything was very tidy. She went back upstairs, put on her coat and hat, and went out, locking the door after her. The buses were running, and she set about such shopping as she could. Talk, talk, talk. Everybody talking, friends, strangers, even old enemies talking together. She heard a woman, no one could help hearing her, not a thing damaged, look, not a window, not a cup, not a blade of grass on the lawn, but the cuckoo in the cuckoo clock. He started at eight this morning and went on cooking 844 times. <gasps> Our Harry counted him, not even soot down the chimney, but that cuckoo he cooked 844 times like our Harry counted. Spring in the air, I said to Harry, but spring a leak, said Harry to me. Something we've come to, I tell you. Mrs. Minot nodded, and though the conversation was already racing past her, there was an explanation for what had happened, if only she could think of it. I had a book blown open on the table, she said loudly to anyone who cared to listen. The window was shut, but the book was blown open, a big Bible with gold clasps on it, blown open. She said nothing about the smudges. That's right, said the woman who'd spoken first. Proper pagans, them Nazis. They'd go for a Bible like St. Patrick went for a snake. There's that cuckoo clock of our Harry's. It cooked 844 times, just like I was telling this lady only this minute. A big Bible with gold clasps, Mrs. Minot repeated, blown wide open and the window shut all the time. She was steady as a rock now and stayed steady. In the afternoon, she was asked to help with meals for the bombed out at the chapel next door and was hard at work till nightfall. She was taking off her apron when a voice behind her said, they hit the cemetery too. Mind, they aren't spreading the news up there. And there was a harsh laugh, better them than us. The first voice continued, one or two made a move last night who might have been expected to stay put forever. Someone else said, shh, shh, shh and the talk ended feebly, as though they'd noticed her, the widow, and remembered Minode, deceased. Inside her own door, Mrs. Minode hesitated, and then went to the parlor. The Bible was shut and flat, the curtains drawn, everything was very tidy. She thought once to look again at the smudges, but instead hurried upstairs, locking her door, forcing a chair back under the knob for safety, fastening the windows. When after many hours she fell asleep, the nightlight was left burning, and it was still burning when she awoke from nightmare. There was a bustling noise under her window at the front door. She saw the clock on the chair at her bedside, 8.15, so she rushed from her bed, tore at the curtains, tore at the catch. Wait, she cried to the milkman, leaving her gate. Wait, I want to pay you. Oh, but it was only, no, wait, she cried again. Don't go. He looked up and groped for his book. Righto. He began to whistle a cheerful jiggy tune that helped her into her dressing gown to the switch on the landing, but no light came, and she had to pass that parlor in the dark. It's not the money, she said at the front door, blessed daylight flooding the passage. I had a bad night. I thought I heard something. I was afraid to go downstairs, and I couldn't get a light. I wanted you to look. It's all dark from the blackout. I've been afraid, I think. I must have been. 
He was a big fat fellow with a bloodhound's face and red hands and put his book into his pocket. The electricity's off all through town, he told her, from, you know, the bombs. He stepped past her, doubling his left fist into his right palm. For your sake and his, I hope he ain't here. He looked back and saw the postman passing the gate. Oi, might be a burglar in this house. Keep an eye on the front. The postman was a small man, a local preacher, and Mrs. Minot had heard him next door many the time. Well, God have mercy on him, a sinner. Amen, said the milkman, nursing his fist. But there was nothing there. The milkman went right through twice, pulling every curtain back, at Mrs. Minot's request looking into cupboards and wardrobes and coming up a bit red-faced from under the bed. Not a sign, he said. Anything seemed to be missing? Not a thing, not a thing. That's a bad lock, said the milkman in the scullery. You could think you'd locked that, and every other time it would have slipped right round to open again. Look, he twisted. But now Mrs. Minode wanted to be on her own. She had her bag in her hand by this time. Not at all, said the milkman, telling a shilling from a halfpenny by the feel of the rim, a pleasure, any time at all. The postman was still there, frowning as he accepted a coin. If we can't help a fellow Christian without taking... Well, but No, I can put it in the collection. And the door closed behind them. Mrs. Minode stood for a moment, holding her heart. Otherwise, it would jump right out of her body. Then she pushed at the parlor door. The Bible was shut and clasped. The china shone. Everything was very tidy. The flat cover of the Bible was the loveliest sight she had ever seen. A fine, broad cover of boards overlaid with black leather, blind-tooled with a gold shield in the center, the edges like yellow silk and flat. But was it quite flat? Was it? Or was there a ruffling of the gilt edge, a mere nail breadth of white against the gold? And were these flattened crumbs of earth from the milkman's boots? Oh, Jesus, were they? Mrs. Minode cupped her hands over her mouth. And then resolutely she crossed to the window table, unclasped the Bible, lifted it open. Again, she had the sensation of a world speeding away from her through the tightening of titanic springs beyond any edge that thought could reach to. Again, there was envelopment by a strung silence through which hummed the tension of taut wires. The Bible had opened at Judges, at a page brown-stained and crumpled, and embedded in the twenty-first verse of the fourth chapter was a sharp, slender, headless nail. Then Yael, Haber's wife, took a nail of the tent and took an hammer in her hand, and went softly unto the general, and smote the nail into his temples, and fastened it into the ground for he was fast asleep and weary, so he died. Mrs. Minode stood there by the table for a very long time. She could feel the heavy gush of blood from her heart and even the damp and chill that slowly crept upwards from her feet, but she had no power of motion nor any means of purposeful thought. There was horror all around her, but it could not break in one bound through the stupefaction which blanketed her reason. She was roused at last by a growing awareness of a smell so foul she could not endure it, and went blunderingly to the kitchen where she was sick. For a long time afterwards she sat by the kitchen fire, watching the orange flame clamber through the sticks and coal. She rubbed her hands together, thrust her shins almost against the bars, and once she got up hurriedly to lock the door leading to the passage. She was piecing things together. She had never lacked nerve, had Mrs. Minode. There had been a time, indeed, at a crisis of her life, when she had shown a credible courage and strength. She was thinking back to that now. An hour later, and she joined a small group of women outside the cemetery gates. These were locked, and a well-spoken patient official was assuring one caller after another that there had been a slight disturbance in the cemetery, it's true, 
No one could be allowed inside just for the present, but everything is in hand, and by tomorrow, I don't doubt, blah, 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 blah. there was no need for distress. The authorities would take care of everything with promptitude, efficiency, and above all, appropriate reverence. But Mrs. Minode wasn't satisfied. In Igloose Street lived an employee of the Parks and Cemeteries Authority who looked none too easy when she knocked at his door after tea. Well, all he could say is, and his words, too, added up to nothing. What part of the cemetery she wanted to know? Oh, well, I can't, I can't answer a question like that. You must excuse me. And he hedged, raised his hands, shook his head. But Mrs. Minode got her answer from his wife's pitying yet gloating eyes. All would be as it was tomorrow. And she started him at that, grabbing his arm. Tomorrow, you're certain? All will be as it was tomorrow? And he swore it on the Bible. There's a woman for you, he told his wife when Mrs. Minode had gone. Now there's devotion, and all for a chap has killed himself with a bottle of brandy. He was a rum sort of chap, too. Something about him you never quite knew where you stood with him. He put his feet inside the fender to get warm. I'll smack him down back to the earth good and hard tomorrow. Too true, I will. And then the man told his wife stories about Minod that made her back crawl. It's a secret, mind, not a word. And I'll have that bottle of beer now, Emmy, I think. Mrs. Minode had a busy evening herself. First, she cleaned the parlor, the bits of earth she threw into the kitchen fire, remarking their color of red. The carpet had a good stiff brushing. The nail, it was rather like a very long gramophone needle, she put into an envelope in her pocket, and the Bible was shut and dusted. When she'd finished, everything was very tidy. She also took the bolt from the coal house door and re-screwed it into the scullery, and she saw to the catches on all of the windows. It pays to be careful to one's bit of property, and she felt better when she was doing something. But before she could go to bed, the raid of the 26th started, and it lasted till long after midnight. There were explosions between her and the cemetery, at which she smiled grimly, in time, bombs fell nearer Igloos Street, and the doors and windows rattled in their frames. This worried her, and from worry she came near panic. If they were blown in, what was to stop anyone, and she'd almost said anything, from entering? She thrust sticks into the kitchen fire, threw on more coal, lit a second nightlight. In a quiet fraction of time, she heard the crackle of her slates as shrapnel fell. Surely no one would be tempted from cover on a night like this. And now a mobile gun ran to the end of the street. It began firing raggedly so that the house shuddered, her saucepans jingled, and the toasting fork alongside the chimney fell frighteningly into the steel fender. This dreadful gun punctuating the uproar was worst of all to bear. Mrs. Minode's bowels leapt at its crack and whine, and waiting through its silence was a new agony. Suddenly, terror drove out terror. The din was at its worst when she saw the knob of the scullery door turn. She got stiffly to her feet, her head jerking forward. The knob was twisted sharply, then furiously, but the bolt held. For a moment it rested, then turned slowly and powerfully left, right, left, right. But the bolt was heavy and the screws long and nothing happened. It rested again, the knob itself like a tiny, round, baffled face. Mrs. Minode grinned. She'd always been too clever for him. She was too clever for everyone. She was still grinning at the knob when there came a knocking at the front door. She stopped then, her eyes going from the scullery to the hall passage. The knocking came again, more loudly. She wavered. It might be him, but it might be a warden, a firefighter, a gunner, a first aid worker. 
and carrying a nightlight, she went swiftly upstairs to her own front room, saw that there were matches handy, blew out the light, and opened her window an inch or two. Who's there? She strained her eyes downwards. Over most of the street, there was a pale blue light pronged with orange and red, but the chapel fell blackly across Brunhufred. Who's there? The gun at the corner sent all other noise rocketing outward. It was in her heart to slam the window, draw the curtains, and have light, but instead she pushed it further up and leaned her shoulders out. Answer me, she cried. Who's there? An unspeakable savor of corruption reached her nostrils. Go back, she cried. Go back where you belong. She began to laugh. The door is locked and you can't get in. I've always been too clever for you. Knock, knock, knock. Go back, she shouted. Go back where I put you. You've only got tonight. And the door is locked and bolted. And she screamed with laughter. Then Mrs. Minode saw a sight that few will see and live. Huge fountains of fire sprouted from the railway station to Igloos Street, each with a roar that shook her head like a doll's. The hollow air sucked her forward. The window sprayed like hail into the street. Stunned and bleeding, she saw where the dark had been a tattered human figure beating at the door below. She fell back into the bedroom as the house opposite reared like a huge red horse. There was a thudding, followed by a lurch, and then a long grinding and crackling. The floor, she found, had tilted under her. And through a new hole in the wall, she could see flames blowing like washing in a wind. And she huddled herself together at the corner of the room and slid out into the roadway. Two thoughts came to her mind. The first, and she had never been more serious, was, well, the government will have to pay for this. But the second was, nothing in the street below could survive that explosion. And she nodded to herself, nothing. She must move, though. There were flames behind her, she could tell, as well as over the street. She got to her feet painfully because she had never lacked nerve, had Mrs. Minode. But at the head of the splintered stairs, she stopped, and for all the fire around her, her blood grew cold and slow as ice. Something was coming up the stairs after her, something on all fours, tattered and scorched with great labor and application. Don't, she cried. Oh, merciful Jesus, don't. It didn't raise its head at her outcry, but slowly dragged its knee one step higher. At each movement, it appeared to overcome some more than mortal dislocation, and past the clean and acrid smells of smoke and red destruction, there came the odor of its decay. Yet its slowness was deceptive for how quickly it came near. She ran back to the bedroom, but the door was out of plumb. She couldn't fasten it. And she hurried, panting, to where the wall fell into the street. But the flames, she could not face them. Through all the uproar of the night, she heard a rubbing and shuffling at the door and saw it open. What entered was shrouded in charred linen, but part of the head was exposed and part of the arms. Her jaw yammered like a dog's at the foul bone, the blue-black of rottenness, the horror of the skull. It turned in her direction, at once moving on wrists and knees, the fingers hooked ahead, purposeful and informed, the nail, the nail. She snatched at the envelope from her pocket, flung it toward the hands, which stopped, the fingers now groped and found. Thank God, she thought, thank God, it will leave me now. The left knee crept forward, the hand thrust for her foot. For the first time, it lifted its face and Mrs. Minode threw herself shrieking into the street. Mortal time had almost ceased for Mrs. Minode. She had but one flicker of sight and thought to come. 
When her eyes opened, it was to see something like a filthy, whitish caterpillar crawling headfirst down the broken brickwork toward her. They were as good as their word at the cemetery. Everything was very tidy there the next day. But that man from Igloos Street swore an oath. Where's this one been, he asked. His companion thought for a second. Looks to Helen back. And the man from Igloos Street bent and considered, My God, he said, and he ran away, but soon returned. It was Minode, deceased, giving him something to think about. Leave him be a while, that's the orders. You see, his wife was killed last night. She's my neighbor. She'd have given him the apples of her eyes, that woman was. Such a good wife. I wish I had one like her. <clears throat> the man bent his back again. You see that? He scraped with his fingernail where you or I would not. It's stuck in the side of his head. It's a gramophone needle. Why, you could play the dead march in Saul on that. Why are we leaving him, grumbled the other. It'll add to our work. No. His wife pined for him, said the man from Igloo Street. Only last night she came around after tea and was asking and bothering us. Before she got hers, that is. They can be buried together now, in just one grave. Dear, dear. I think that's nice, said the man from Igloo Street. Thank you.